Bonsoir. Guten Abend. Buonasera. Good evening. It is my pleasure, as local chair with my colleague Claire Cliva of this year's conference, to welcome you to Switzerland, to our beautiful but rainy campus, and to this brand new Swiss Tech Conference Center. Tonight, we will have the pleasure to hear Bruno Latour's introductory keynote. But before this, please welcome Neil Freistadt, Chair of the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organization, ADHO. Wow, look at you. I just tweeted a photo of uh, what the auditorium looks like from this perspective. It's astonishing. Bienvenue, mes amis. I'm Neil Freistadt, the director of MISTH, the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities. And in my capacity as chair of ADHO's steering committee, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to DH 2014 on behalf of our six constituent organizations, EADH, the European Association for Digital Humanities, ACH, the Association for Computers and the Humanities, Citizen, the Canadian Digital Humanities Association, AADH, the, Austra the Australasian Association for Digital Humanities, Centernet, the International Network of Digital Humanities Centers, and JADH, the Japanese Association for Digital Humanities. This has been an extraordinary year for ADO on multiple fronts, most notably in continued changes to our institutional structure, our technical infrastructure, our relationship with members, our publications, and of course, our annual conference. Here you are. Over 700 participants, I think, did we say, Melissa, 750? Wow. Those of you who have had a chance to review the full program know the kind of intellectual feast that awaits you this week, beginning with our opening keynote today from Bruno Latour. For this, we are all greatly indebted to the remarkable job done by our International Program Committee which has been chaired so masterfully and tirelessly by Melissa Terrace. This group, I was going to ask you all to stand. Would you all stand now, the International Program Committee? Melissa? They all deserve a big hand. They have been working for two years behind the scenes just to prepare for this week. And they've further built upon last year's program committee's successful experiments with key elements of our submission and review process to make it more welcoming, open, efficient, and rewarding for all concerned. We owe them our deep gratitude. I'm sorry to say that due to a death in the family, Bethany Novitsky won't be able to be here to deliver her keynote in person, but Melissa has kindly agreed to present Bethany's texts and slides. I know our community's thoughts are with Bethany. One new element to this year's conference is an attempt to facilitate informal and voluntary translation by distributing buttons people can wear, indicating what languages they are willing to talk or otherwise assist in. This effort is a result of a collaboration between ADHO's Global Outlook Special Interest Group and our Multilingualism and Multiculturalism Committee. Please be on the lookout for the I Whisper In buttons that you can find near the registration desk and offer to wear one if you're fluent in a language other than English. We're especially grateful to Alika Ortega, Dan O'Donnell, and Alex Heal of GoDH for helping to organize this effort. ADHO has been growing exponentially. We, we now have over 850 individual members, and this trend has no end in sight. We on ADHO Steering Committee continue to recognize that our largest challenges in the coming year 
involve how well we welcome, enable, and promote the accelerating global and disciplinary growth of DH across the range of our activities. To this end, we've been engaging in what so far has been a year-long strategy process, focusing on three areas we believe to be most in need of fundamental rethinking, at host governance, funding, and membership. The results of that strategy process, when coupled with ADHO's newly established status as an independent legal entity in the Netherlands, promises to be the most systematic and wide-ranging resituating of ADHO to date. Meanwhile, our inclusivity working group, which was established last year under the auspices of Bethany Nowitzki, continues to assist our committees in examining their governing documents, public communications, and evolving customs to help develop or refine policies, protocols, and informal practices meant to welcome more diverse constituencies to ad hoc and to strengthen the organization through their involvement. A major step in this direction and directly re relevant to all of us here was our development this year of a conference code of conduct, which lays out broad principles to foster a safe, welcoming conference environment that is respectful of personal, cultural, and linguistic differences. This code of conduct can be found within your conference program and on the websites of DH 2014 and of ADHO. Among ADHO's accomplishments this year has been the establishment of low membership only rates for our constituent organizations. Our first special interest group, Global Outlook, has been joined by several other new or proposed ones including a proposal in progress for a DH and social justice SIG coordinated by Lisa Nakamura and Gentry Sayers. We expect that many of our SIGs will be based on new approaches, collaborations, and disciplinary concerns, and we encourage you to propose one. Last year, we chose Sydney, Australia as the conference venue for DH 2015, the first time ever that the conference will be hosted outside of Europe and North America. This year, we've adopted a new three-year regional conference rotation, ensuring that an opening for such venues will be regularly and predictably available. And we've selected, as some of you may know already, Krakow, Poland, as the site of DH 2016. We invite you to learn more about the activities of ad host constituent organizations in the lunchtime members meetings that will be held by EADH, ACH, ADHO and CenterNet over the course of this week. The ACH meeting tomorrow will include its justly celebrated annual job slam, and the joint ADHO CenterNet meeting on Friday will include short reports about DH in Russia, Israel, and the Caribbean, as well as a DH Commons project slam. One of ADHO's ways of welcoming promising new members in our community and celebrating the achievements of those already working in the field is the presentation of prizes. We're delighted to say that we've been able to offer a record number of student bursaries to DH 2014. And as you may know from the conference schedule, the Zampoli Award will be presented this Thursday to one of the DH community's most widely respected and foundational figures, Ray Siemens. At the conference banquet and in the closing session on Friday, you'll hear more about the other prizes. One of these is the Fortier Prize, which, which will be awarded to the young scholar giving the best presentation at this conference. The Fortier Prize honors the memory of Paul Fortier, who lived from 1939 to 2005. Paul had a keen ear not just for new voices, but also for the newness in what those voices had to say. In 1993, Paul was awarded the honor of University Distinguished Professor by the University of Manitoba, where he had taught at the rank of professor since 1979 in the Department of French, Spanish, and Italian. The winners of last year's 48 Prize were Courtney Evans and Ben Jasno, both from the University of Virginia, for their paper, Mapping Homer's Catalog of Ships, this year's carefully selected shortlist features, can we get the slide? There. Marie, Marie Saldana, an integrated approach to the procedural modeling of ancient cities and buildings. Anthony Durdy and James O'Sullivan on 
reusability in electronic literature, Jerome Joaquin and Xavier Gradu, Impact, and Jill Belly, Unhappy, there's an app for that. One of these will receive the 48 Prize 2014 to be handed out during the closing session. We hope that many of you will be there with us to celebrate the winner. Finally, ADHO is especially pleased to be holding this year's DH conference on the splendid campuses of UNEAL and EPFL in recognition of the distinguished work in digital humanities being done here. We thank you for welcoming us so warmly to your campus. Our special thanks, of course, go to Claire Cliva and Frederic Kaplan, our local co-organizers, co who have done so much to make this conference possible, and their hardworking staff, especially the indispensable Kevin Balmer. Let's have a heartfelt round of applause for them all. Would you stand? I leave you with best wishes for a stimulating intellectual journey this week, and I hope to see many of you at our sessions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Neil. Please now welcome Dominic Arletta, rector of the University of Lausanne. Dear organizers, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to open this 2014 conference on digital humanities, which takes place here in Lausanne, and to welcome all of you on behalf of the University of Lausanne. The University of Lausanne and the EPFL share the same campus and have a lot of collaborations on the day-to-day -day basis. And this explains why this conference is jointly organized by both institutions. I would start by thanking all of you, thanking all of you to be here in Lausanne for this event. You came from all over the world and you will bring us your expertise and your willingness to discuss the issues of education and research in digital humanities. I also would like to thank the organizers of this conference, in particular Professor Claire Cliva from the University of Lausanne and Professor Frédéric Kaplan from the EPFL. She did a great job to bring you all in this room and to have everything prepared for you. I am sure that you'll have a nice conference and that you'll have spend a good time in Lausanne. Let me start with a cit citation. This made possible the development of modern science and literature. It brought about the biggest changes in human culture since the invention of the alphabet. This sentence does not concern digital humanities. It's a citation from the book by the British historian John Mann, published in 2002 with the title The Gutenberg Revolution, the story of a genius and an invention that changed the world. It is clear that the invention of printing could really accelerate the rise of Western culture during the first half of the 15th century. The invention of printing was for sure a revolution in mankind history, a revolution which had a tremendous impact on the way to transfer knowledge and to have access to original texts and thus to science. But we are now at the beginning of the 21st century. Today, the joint use of the long expertise in humanities and the new digital technologies change again the way to find access to arts and humanities. This is again obviously a revolution, the digital revolution. My generation has seen incredible changes. I remember, remember when I started my job as a, prof, as a young professor at the University of Lausanne in 1988, our institute just bought the first personal computer and the web did not exist at that time. Okay, I'm quite old now, but it is still incredible to see how many new tools are available today and really change some aspects of any scientific activity. I will not provide more comments on that because this is exactly the subject of your discussions 
during this conference, so you'll do it much better than myself. However, let me just add one comment. It is clearly true that digital humanities represent a big challenge for our time and for the population of our planet. It is certainly a revolution, but by definition, a revolution gives you the possibility to make one big step towards the unknown. Nobody exactly knows the impact of new developments of the digital world. Of course, many people have some ideas on that impact. And since you are experts, you probably have quite a precise vision. However, the future is still not known. To imagine the future, which is by definition, by definition not known, this is exactly the core of any scientific process. And remember that in order to make progress, you first need to be curious. To be curious is a key ingredient for any research work, even without thinking at the immediate usefulness of the research. But we all know that it is not easy to decide if a scientific result is useful or not. And who knows what will be useful in due time. For that, let me take an example from mathematics, my own field of research, and tell you the story of the French mathematician Évariste Galois. Probably many of you know this story, but let me tell you again. Évariste Galois was born on October 25th, 1811, and at 16, he was already a passionate and remarkable mathematician. In 1829, at 18, he wrote a thesis that he presented for the Grand Prize of Mathematics of the Académie des Sciences in Paris. Also, his peers and professors considered him a genius. He did not win the prize, and the rest of his career was a succession of mishaps and failures. He failed at the entrance examination of the École Polytechnique. He was expelled from the École Préparatoire, that was not yet called the École Normale Supérieure, and he was jailed for six months before presenting again a thesis for the prize of the Académie des Sciences and failing once again. His problems with his prestigious French school were hardly compensated by success in his personal life. Indeed, in 1832, he fell in love with a young woman, but for reasons remained unclear, he fought a duel with a man in love with the same woman, and he was killed on the 30th of May, 1832, aged barely 20. However, Galois spent the night before the duel working on his research, and in the morning after he was killed, the manuscript of that night's work was found in the pocket of his coat. Only 10 years later would the equations on this manuscript be elucidated by the French mathematician Liouville, who presented them to the Académie des Sciences, and only then was Galois' work accepted and recognized. This tragic story is a little parable about the usefulness of scientific work. Galois invented a theory that bears his name today and is an essential domain in algebra, but he had strictly no idea what it may be useful for. His theory explains why it is possible or not to solve polynomial equations. This may sound very nebulous and abstract to you, but I can tell you to that today, two centuries later, Galois' theory is the basis of coding process, without which we would have no barcodes, no credit cards, and no mobile phones. All this happened thanks to a completely disinterested act of research of a man that no official institution found very useful in his time. In the same spirit, nobody exactly knows what will be the evolution of the digital revolution. But we all know that the impact of this revolution will be quite important. And this is exactly the starting point of your conference. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for discussing this important issue. And I would like to conclude by wishing you a lot of curiosity. I also hope you'll have a very good time in Lausanne, maybe not only for lectures and discussions, but I hope you will enjoy the wonderful campus, the city of Lausanne the lake and maybe the Alps if the weather is better than today. Thank you very much. Have a nice week here in Lausanne.
Please now welcome Patrick Ebicher, President of the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. So in the name of EPFL, I would also like to welcome you here at EPFL. For me, it's a very special moment to see you all in this new auditorium that we've just inaugurated a couple of weeks ago. And to have here a Congress on Digital Humanities, which is so close to my heart, is really something very moving. I am passionate by your field. Not that I know, I'm a, neuro, I'm, a, I'm a medical doctor and neuroscientist by training. But I think that this digital revolution is changing the world. We all know that. But I'm also totally convinced that it's going to change universities. It is already doing so in education. A lot of you may have heard of MOOCs. Some of you may have taught through MOOCs technology. But I think this is a kind of a new tsunami that is coming. We do not know exactly where it will bring us, but something is happening. Knowledge is now accessible to many more people than before to those technologies. I've spent six months in Africa recently to see the potential of this technology for Africa, French part of Africa. Just to give you an indication, we registered today about 8,000 students on our MOOC courses, which is about equivalent to the number of students that we have on campus. This is something we could have never thought about a couple of years ago. But certainly it's also changing research. Crowdsourcing is becoming a new tool. It's modifying my own field in neuroscience, in molecular biology, in structural biology. Uh, we have, we're the host of a now well-known project called the Human Brain Project that has gained 1 billion euros with a very big discussion going on today about the usefulness of big science and the potential, in fact, of crowdsourcing. But I think it brings new bridges. It bridges new disciplines. Certainly between the technical sciences, the natural science, and the humanities and the social sciences. This is what is fascinating. I was always fascinated by Pic de la Mirandole. When I remember in high school, we were taught that he was the last man on, hum on, on earth that knew everything about current knowledge. This would not be possible today. But I was very inspired by the, what the Frédéric Kaplan did on this Venice Time Machine project. And I visited with him several times the archives, the state archives of Venice, seeing about 90 kilometers of document and say, who could ever think about knowing what is in there? But the capability of uh, digitization, of machine learning, of data mining, to try to extract this data and make it available and link it in an intelligent fashion is something that just makes you dream. I always tell them that maybe the the next FED flagship project, the one billion, should be in the digital humanities. And you will bear the criticism. But I think we have to think big. And I've been stunned by the fact that when I talk to my colleagues of humanities, they're afraid to think big. So the only thing I could encourage you today is think big. And the fact that you are so many already in this auditorium is an indication that your field is becoming important and visible. And this is, for me, extremely important. Last but not least, I think we also have to think if there is research, there should be an education. So if here at EPFL, we have decided to launch a digital science education, a bachelor with people that would master mathematics, the statistics, but also the computer science and also the humanities. This is a big challenge, but I think it's only by training those people that we will be able to bring those fields together. So we have decided to launch such a field here at EPFL in collaboration with the University of Lausanne and the University of Geneva and others around the world. We also have decided to create an institute of digital humanities and 
or Center for Digital Humanities, where we'll bring people that could bring new knowledge technologies to this very challenging multidisciplinary field, but however fascinating. My only worry was that when I was always talking to Frederick is, do the people exist? I see they do. You are here. So I'm going to just take advantage of making a little publicity. We're going to open three or four new faculty positions in digital humanities. So I hope some of you will look into it because we need you to bring this new field where it belongs. So with this, I would like to wish you all the best during this week. As my colleague Dominique Aleta just said, enjoy our campuses, enjoy the place, I hope it will be inspiring for your fascinating field. Thank you for your attention. Claire Cliva, professor at the University of Lausanne, will say a few words now as co-local organizer of this year's conference. Maybe you have already heard these ancient words of wisdom that describe astonishment. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived. For me, it illustrates quite well the feelings you can have when you are attending for the first time at a DH meeting. Overwhelmed by novelties, you discover humanities as you have never imagined them. You pass from one session to another, trying to put together in your mind your usual passionate humanist work and what you see. Such a digital astonishment can be an ambiguous feeling. Yes, it can give one of the strongest impulse to look for frontiers of knowledge and creative innovation but it can also keep a person in a silent and immobile attitude with fears and hesitations. To transform this digital astonishment into a creative power, we need a network of people, a community. After two years of intense preparation, Frédéric Kaplan and me, we can truly say that the digital humanist community exists and represents the real digital empowerment. Consequently, our first word of recognition is for the ADO Steering Committee and its chair, Neil Freistadt. In Hamburg at the DH 2012, even if almost no ADO's high, no ADO's here had seen Frédéric Kaplan or me, ADO chosen us with confidence to organize the DH 2014. Melissa Terras, our brilliant teacher, has surely a mind able to conceive the inconceivable. She guided us with patience and clairvoyance in the construction of this amazingly huge meeting. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived. These ancient words of wisdom can be found in Jewish, Christian, and Muslim traditions. They illustrate quite well the cultural flexibility that digital humanities encourages by leading texts and images out of the book. It's just a beginning. It's just the first moment where our cultural empowerment is going far beyond the limits of the Western world, opening to the oral cultures, notably. To dare to discover this digital world, to make this meeting more than a dream, we benefited constantly of the strong encouragement of our two institutions, the University of Lausanne and the EPFL. It is an honor for us and a gift to welcome at this opening ceremony our president, Patrick Ebicher, and our rector, 
Dominique Carletta. As captains of our two flagships, they have coached us until today. Beyond the turbulence is normally present in a new academic challenge. Now, I believe that Switzerland is ready to take its place in the international DH research, standing at the core of Europe, at least geographically speaking. In the team of our both vessels, we thank the warmly our vice rector and vice president, Philippe Morillon and Philippe Gillet, as well as the Dean of the Faculty of Social and Political Sciences, Fabien Eul, and the Director of the Humanities College, Thomas David, for their constant concern for the digital humanities. We won't be here without the strong support of all the teams of UNIL and EPFL, UNIBAT, UNICOM, the Swiss Tech team, our own teams, the DH Lab, APFL, and the LADUL, are of course at the core of our recognition, as well as the colleagues who have supported the event. In particular, we thank the soul of our meeting, Kevin Bomer, our event coordinator, who simply empowered us all and the team of colleagues of our local committee from diverse Swiss academic institutions, Karl Haberer, Jeannette Frey, Benoît Carbinato, Philippe Canel, Isabel Kratz, Enrico Natale, Lucas Rosenthaler, Michael Stoltz, François Valoton, Boris Vedoyevsky, and Dominique Vinck, the director of the LADL, the Laboratory of Digital, cultures and humanities at the University of Lausanne. Last but not least, our sponsors and our academic partners have supported us with confidence. Yendix and Clarin, the Swiss National Science Foundation, InfoClio, the Faculty of Social and Political Sciences at UNIL, the Humanities College at EPFL. Thank you a lot to all. Welcome to Lausanne. It is now my pleasure to introduce Melissa Terrace, Program Chair of the Digital Humanities 2014. She took the incredible hard work of dealing with the most successful DH conference ever done, well, at least in terms of number of submissions. Please welcome Melissa Terrace. Hello. It's so nice to see you here in person. For the last two years, I've been emailing and contacting people, and here you are, you're here. It was two years ago this week that I put up my hand when people asked for volunteers to be the program chair. I thought, yeah, it's my turn, I've got to do it. And the last two years, it's been my pleasure to steer this giant ship through. It has been the biggest ever conference, as well as a number of people attending here. We had over 600 submissions in the first phase to Confto. That's about 150 more than last year, from 2,500 authors working in the digital humanities in nine different languages. So we are now at a stage where our field is going international. Just to give you some maths on that, to make sure that everybody's paper is reviewed successfully, we need at least three, sometimes four, sometimes five reviews on each paper. So we needed to get in 2,700 reviews to make sure that everyone's paper was reviewed successfully. The problem with that is at the moment we only have 300 reviewers in the reviewers database. So that means there was an incredibly a lot of hard work it was done by a lot of people sitting here today and one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was about considering becoming a reviewer for digital humanities if you're not already as our conference grows as our community grows we are dependent on review to make sure that the quality of things which are shown here is high enough we need peer review I will remind you about that at the closing ceremony, which seems a long way away now, but in three days time when we close this, we're gonna be putting a call out for peer reviewers and we really do need your help as our conference grows. 
The acceptance rate was about 50%, which is kind of right for this uh, size of gathering. We made some changes this year. There are many, many more posters than there were before, but we're very pleased with quite a succinct program with uh, various uh, interesting pockets. My favourite session, I think, there are three papers about serendipity. Way, who could have predicted that? How serendipitous. There are a few people I want to thank. The first is my crew, the crew who have served on the programme committee. These were the people that filled in the gaps at the end. These were the people that did 20, 30, 40, 50 peer reviews to make sure that everything was ticking along behind the scenes. These were the people that helped me sift through these 2,700 peer reviews to make sure that the programme you see here today is a fair one and that we decided in as fair and a collegial way as possible what got through the door to be able to be presented here. I'm going to name them here. A vice chair, Deb Verhoeven, and Deb is going to be program chair next year for Sydney. We also have John Bradley, Ji Sang, Jane Hunter, Amy Morrison, Dan O'Donnell, Sarah Potvin, James Smithies, Takafumi Suzuki, Tomoji Tabata, Toro Tomobeki, Glenn Worthy, Vika Zafrin, and our outgoing chair, who can't be with us today, Bethany Nowiski. Can everyone please give a round of applause to the programme committee? I would also like to thank the Chair of the Conference Coordinating Committee, John Nerbon. John has been amazingly helpful this year. Here's the person that I immediately turned to whenever I needed advice, or whenever I needed to throw my rattle out the pram about stuff, or whenever I needed to be told to pick up my rattle and just get on with things. So he has been immensely helpful. He will be the one who will be contacting everyone at the end of the conference, asking for more reviewers as the Conference Coordinating Committee tries to extend our reviewer database. I also need to thank, I would like to thank Elizabeth Burr, the Chair of the Multilingual and Multicultural Issues Committee and her army of volunteers who translated the call for papers into 27 different languages this year. This is a phenomenal amount of crowdsourced work and we'd very much like to thank Elizabeth. So please can we thank John and Elizabeth for their work. And finally, I'd like to thank our local hosts, Claire and Frederic, and their team members, most notably Kevin, who has been amazing. It's, uh, we are dependent on digital technologies to organise a conference like this being so far away. I did most of the organisation from London. Um, and it's been magnificent to work with a dispersed team who have all come together to deliver this programme. It's been a real honour to serve as programme chair for the last two years. I hope you find more than a few things which are interesting in the programme. I look forward to meeting many of you in person who I've only communicated with on email or on Twitter over the past couple of years. Thank you for coming and thank you very much for submitting and attending DH 2014. It is an extremely great pleasure and honour for us tonight to welcome Bruno Latour. Not only because Bruno Latour is both a provocative thinker and one of the world's most acclaimed scholars, according to Wikipedia, is actually among the 10 most cited researchers in human science. Not only because discussing with him helped us a lot shaping our research and pedagogical activities in Lausanne, but because Bruno Latour is, even if he may not admit it, one of the founding fathers of the digital humanities. The central theme of his 1991 book, We Have Never Been Modern, is precisely the gap between the natural sciences and culture, introducing Europe with the Enlightenment. Bruno Latour works clearly demonstrate how this particular way of conceiving the world leads us to an intellectual trap, leaving us unable to understand the complex world we were building. Year after year, book after book, Bruno Latour has demonstrated how the science and the humanities, how objects and subjects, how nature and culture are intrinsically embedded in complex networks, and how artificial and dangerous our conception of knowledge in which disciplines protect themselves into rigid silos. His latest book, An Inquiries into Modes of Existence, offers a unique cartography of the coexistence of different regimes of truth. It can be read like a user manual for understanding how contemporary knowledge is composed and negotiated. I really think that all digital humanities researchers should read this book because it deals with the very essence of what digital humanities are trying to achieve. 
The book is available in print, but also online, through an extremely well thought interface, inviting readers to participate, to contradict, to extend the author's initial text. Bruno Latour and his team conceive it as a place of debate and negotiation. This should sound familiar to you. The digital humanities global conversation, its welcoming big tent, are much in line with Bruno Latour's project and his idea of diplomatics between disciplines. Bruno Latour's recent experimentation for inventing new ways of teaching and learning also meets one of the digital humanities' central focus inventing new pedagogical practice beyond traditional disciplinary teaching. I encourage you to register to his extremely well-crafted MOOC on scientific humanities. It is, as we say in French, a model du genre. So in a nutshell, what I'm saying is that even if you may not be aware of it, if you view yourself as a digital humanist, you are certainly, in a way or another, a Latourian, believing in global multicultural debates, on the importance of representing the complexity of knowledge with maps, diagrams, and other new forms of visualization, and ultimately sharing this beautiful, nuanced view of the world. So again, please read Bruno Latour's work, follow Bruno Latour's online courses, and give him a warm welcome as the first keynote speaker of the Digital Humanities 2014 conference. Well, I was going to say that I apologize to Patrick Abisher and say that I'm not a specialist of, I cannot apply for the job since he has a lot of them in digital humanities, but after what Frédéric so nicely said, I might apply for the job and it seems a nice job and certainly much better than the French institution that the rector of the other university mentioned, a sad story of Evaris Galois we doesn't say much about French institution at the time. They rejected geniuses in mathematics, this is bad. And it has not improved, unfortunately. <laughs> what I'm going to present is not a talk in digital humanities, but in a talk in uh, two parts. One where I will uh, sort of present in a rather dogmatic fashion a few principles of study. I'm coming from the history of science and sociology uh, of science. And another one which is, I'm sorry, the only experience I have in digital humanity about the experiment that I've done with my colleagues who are participating to this uh, PowerPoint here uh, in the mode of existence close reading uh, experiment. So this is what I will uh, do. And um, I hope that, oh yes, no. This is, of course, one of my points about the difficulty of technology. And it's supposed to, oh, okay, it's coming. So, um, the few preliminary points dogmatically stated, I would start with the first one, which is the argument about the cloud effect fallacy. This idea that when we are doing with the digital, when we are dealing with the digital, we are moving in a sort of virtual world and that things are somewhere in the cloud, and the cloud is very much hype, and hype and cloud is the same metaphor, and when exactly the opposite is actually true. The more people talk of the virtual, the more actually material uh, it is. And uh, the nice things from the New York Times says that worldwide, the digital warehouse use about 30 billion watt of electricity, roughly equivalent to the output of 30 nuclear power plants. So this is a nice reminder that when we are talking about moving from the real to the digital, we are moving from the real to the more real, for the expensive to the more expensive, for the down to earth to the even more down to earth. So there is nothing cloudy or nothing hype in the digital. It's on, con on the contrary, a way of rematerializing the cognitive aspect. And that's my second point, the second dogmatically stated point, which is what could be called the cognitive fallacy. The more people talk about cognitive function, the more they actually describe a socio-technical environment. And it's certainly not this university which will say the opposite because the price, the billions, 
that has to be spent in order to map our brain and the huge infrastructure necessary to make cognitive science active is actually a good proof of that argument. Is that if you want to visualize what happens in a brain, you need to expand a lot of the socio-technical element. And it's the same when you give a lecture, imagine the mass of technical element, institution, energy, and uh, installation which have to be put into place for the cognitive function to actually take place. So it's very linked that if we can and are able to manifest traces in our brain, we actually get only a segment of a vast institution, a socio-technical institution, which is so important for the making of that cognitive function. So cognition is not in the brain, it only, it's just brain is just one little part, and the rest has to be studied and mapped as well. The third fallacy, which goes to the heart of the notion of digital itself, is what could be called the digital analogical divide fallacy. And I'm here borrowing from the work of um, Simon Schaffer, Adam Lowe, and Brian Cantley-Smith, that shows that actually digitality is the achievement of a computer, and the computer is a highly complex institution which uses redundancy to obtain at, out of analogical um, signal, and every single signal is always analogical electrically, to achieve digitality only is possible through the repetition, refreshment, and constant checkup of all the signal in order to achieve the zero and one famous distinction. But it's not native, it's not autochthonous. Autochthony in the computer is actually always digital. You have here an example of Contley Smith argument that, uh, I mean, mapping the precise analogical signal, electric signal, which produce digitality only later. So we have to understand the computer itself as an institution, which means, and it's very important, and I'll come back at the end of my talk, that uh, actually the digital, which is a better word than the numérique, which is a French version which actually in French, I think we should say digital as well, because it reminds you of the materiality of the process. When we are, there's another fallacy, which is now closer to the digital humanity field, your field, which is this idea that the book, the old book, was closed, so to speak, that it was actually something which now move out in the virtual world of uh, the, the digital. But actually, the difference between scriptoria, which is this, the word that is used by medievists to describe a complex action in copying, interpreting, collide, colliding book, etc., is actually very much like what could be called screentoria, which is the thing we, we live through. We all work, actually, in screentoria. We are not monk. We don't have always... Uh, to uh, take the vow of celibacy, fortunately for many of us, but we live in scriptoria, in screen toria, in the sense that the task of working on complex interface in, with a collective group is actually common to all of the disciplines, and not only the scholarly discipline, but here, as you see, in the bottom, in uh, the traders, um, in a bank, uh, the screen, that is the set of screen, which is itself a highly complex device, which is used in the bank in uh, Paris, the BNP bank. So when we actually talk about a screen or a book, we talk about a very complex display, and many of you uh, have criticized the notion of a, of a book. I mean, shown how complex is actually the paper book. And it's actually interesting to see that many commentators in digital humanities are coming from medievist, medieval studies, middle age studies, because they are very well uh, adjusted to the complexity of, a, of a, the scriptoria, and it resembles a lot the sort of thing that we are now working through with scriptoria. So if you take this fallacy together, we can locate what is digital in digital humanities. And I think what is digital is that the, there are a few segments in the set of continuous practices that we are doing, which are 
uh, materialized, visualized by the digital. But the digital is not a domain. The digital makes visible a few traces in a continuous set of activities which remain completely material in the old sense of the world, which depend on technology, which depend on the social world, and which are not visible directly by the digital. So I'm trying to shift the argument from the digital as a domain to the digital as the underlining of a few segment in the trajectory of practices which has to be described. And I'll give a few examples of that. The first example is what uh, the extraordinary transformation uh, that is now going to be uh, undergone in the social theory. I'm from social sociology myself. And here I will use the argument that uh, Dominique Boullier has made that there are three moments in the social theory in the 20th century. One of them is that the, the link between the invention of statistics and the very, very notion of society. That's the first sort of stage. Then comes the polls, the whole practice of polling, which produce this new object, not to say this new artifact, which is called opinions. And opinion is not the same as society because the techniques of grasping the social is itself different. And we are entering now what could be called, and there's no word for that, of course, the capturing of traces, of digital traces, which captures a very, very different uh, attitudes in the social world, which allows to define it. There's no word for that. There's a word for society, there is a word for opinions. So maybe the word vibration would be the word. What is captured by the digital are those very, very, very quick vibration, which are not uh, opinions, which are very, very different from social relations, and which are feeding the uh, databases on which we all uh, rely. The second example which I will take, and I will show a little film, is of course what the way it completely transforms the uh, archives, and many of you in the proceeding of this conference work on archiving a data set, and here is an example from two people who are working in a media lab in, in Sciences Po, which is a, a study of the way when you are in the archives you can follow the work of artists. This is the 70s artist in New York who worked at the margin between uh, technology and uh, new media and art and uh, who have been studied by Christophe Leclerc, who is uh, working in, in Paris in my center. And uh, what is very interesting here is that he does not, of course, describe the creative act itself, but he describes archives allowed to follow a lot of the uh, segment, the whole trajectory of which make up the creative act. And it's quite interesting to see that it's possible, and many of you have invented similar tools, that it's possible to understand what it means to grasp in a very, very different way element of the archives. And of course, now the archives is produced automatically, so to speak, by the mass of data that we leave behind when we work collectively together. I'll come back to that in the second part of my talk. So if you have a data scape like this, you can begin to gather things which were absolutely impossible to gather before because most of the element of a creative act were actually lost or invisible. It doesn't mean that the activity is now digital. Again, I make the same point. It means that digitality allows to underline a few segments of what an artist, when they collaborate, artist and engineer, and here in a minute you will see, behind you see the archive that Christophe has uh, gathered, and in a minute you will see the old technology, which some of you, I'm sure, remember, this old <laughs> technology, one of the early days of a digital analogical practice of, I don't know the name in English, uh, cart? What's the word for that? Punch cart. So this is a third example, which I want to show, is very well known and is much closer from my own field of history and sociology of science, which is a possibility of making visible the connection between scientists. And it's a case coming from a very dramatic controversy around the climate gate in uh, October 2009, 
when uh, this is the, the connection between the email that climato climatologists send to one another. And if you remember, these uh, emails were downloaded and uh, climatoskeptics use the connection between all those scientists as a proof that the sciences was actually bunk. So they certainly discovered that scientists did communicate, did send email, did discuss and collaborate with one another. And it was a great surprise because before science was supposed to come from the cloud, it was supposed to be invisible, people were not supposed to talk, there was supposed to be no scientific community, and the fact <clears throat> of showing a scientific community was for them enough to prove that it was uh, a fraud. And you know actually that the community was then audited and absolutely nothing untoward was found. But the very, very surprise was that actually scientists do communicate with one another and depend on a vast social network in order to work. It's also pretty nice ways of, of showing the, uh, the data set. A last example is important, and of course, I could have taken the example of Frédéric uh, Kaplan's own work here on the, what is called massive digital humanities, and this is what many of you uh, do here. This is an example from Moretti in Stanford, and I'm sure you, many of you, and all of you probably, know uh, what can be done when instead of studying one novel, you study the whole set of novels of one century. And this sort of ways of doing humanities is still very shocking to the people, but not, of course, in this room, because if you are here, it's because you are not shocked by that sort of massive distant reading of large corpora, which doesn't mean that you don't read Shakespeare as well. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So to summarize, cloud, this idea that we are dealing with thinking and cognition and that we have to decide between the up or the down, as in the famous Raphael's uh, painting in the Vatican, is actually more like this, which is a very nice mess of scientists and scholars studying together and surrounded by vastly technical setup and moving around into small groups. This is the Academy of Science presenting their work to Louis XIV, the equivalent of our president here, who has the same ambition as you heard, that is thinking big. So was Louis XIV, of course. <laughs> so, bottom line one, most, most sec I'm sorry for the dogmatic tone in which I assert all these things, but this is the point I need to make before getting into the less certain aspect, the experiment I will decode in a minute. Most segment of networks uh, remain invisible for the digital tool. So the digital tool is just a way to multiply, to help materializing a few of them. And the great uh, fallacy of the digital is to believe that we are moving from reality to another world. No, we are underlining a few of the elements in a world which remains massively real, if you want to say, to use this ex ex example. Bottom line two, digital humanity is really underlining and gathering those little elements of the whole setup of cognitive and socio-cognitive life that we can underline. And uh, strangely enough, I think that the, next, the net result of the uh, digital is actually a rematerialization. I mean, this is why I use it in the terms of my talk. The net result is an extension of analogical, because even the computer, as I said, is actually a very complex institution which achieves digitality, but which is not digital in itself. And it's that return of analogical and rematerialization which will open the humanities, as I show at the end of the lecture, in many, many different fields than the one we have touched upon so far. So this is my first part of my talk, and I move to the other one. Completely different tone. This is not dogmatic. It's an experiment which uh, has only the interest of having been uh, done for the last uh, three years and it might interest you because there are not that many examples 
of digital humanities on closed reading. So I'm not talking about uh, massive distant reading. Many of you do it. This is what Frédéric is doing with this Venice project. But here I want to concentrate on another example. And the hypothesis that we pursued in this project is the following. Is it possible to relocate some of the skills that were necessary before, not for distant massive reading, but for closed reading of complex text, very complex, I'm afraid, uh, with the digital techniques? So the example I'm now going to decode and debrief is an example of closed reading where we try to figure out how is it possible to shift the habit, some of the habit of paper book in scriptoria to reading complex argument in screentoria. And this is what I want to decode with you tonight. This is of course very tentative and it largely depends on the work of my colleague. So this is a ERC finance, ERC is a European founding, this is basic research. Um, and it's a philosophical model, an anthropological argument. I have no time to get into the argument called the mode of existence and Frederick mentioned it. And it's a very complex project. It's an anthropology and philosophical project. So it's a good example. Is it possible to use some of the te digital techniques in order to underline some of the aspects of having to grow through close uh, reading? It's a fairly paradoxical attempt because uh, it fits no clear custom in the digital humanities. One of them is, the first one is that it's a very traditional text. It's written in the old way in, the, in prose, yes, prose, argumentative prose in a philosophical and anthropological literature tone. And yet, it uses a high-tech set of devices to make it accessible and to concentrate attention on the closed reading. So this is the, this is the first strange element of that project. The second one is that it's, it's, it's uh, completely open, it's free, but it's a closed site. And close is a very important point in what I want to uh, present to you, because as many uh, cognitive scientists and analysts of the book have shown, closeness and close reading and closure are actually linked. The third element is that it's a collaborative project but the question we ask the co-inquirers to work on are highly constrained. So it's more like a scientific experiment. It's not free-floating. It's saying, do you or can you answer the following sets of questions in any uh, discipline way? The fourth one, and that's highly disputed, there was lots of disagreement uh, among that, is that it's actually trying to block completely the culture of the web of open discussion and everyone doing his opinions. So it's actually against the notion of commentaries and it tried to move from commentaries to contribution. Commentary is nice, but it means that everybody speaks one's mind without being disciplined, without being, having any uh, real argument or without being able or having to read the book or read the argument. Here on the contrary, we try to concentrate a close reading by stopping <laughs> interrupting the urge to comment and do these horrible things that people do at the end of your papers when they are on blogs or where there are uh, articles on newspaper. No people around it except contributors. And of course this is disputed and uh, it's hard to agree on that, sorry. And uh, the last one, sorry, I moved too fast. So the fourth, the, the fifth one, uh, is that it's, and that's much more common to all of the experiments that you do in digital humanities, it's cross reading but it's distributed in space and time. And how do you organize the distribution in space and time? This is a question which is as old as the book itself, but which is trying to be again modified and highlighted differently by the digital. And finally, can we invent a set of devices or digitally enhanced devices for what could be called thick description or thick digital argumentation. There is no word for that. What is it to actually get deeper into a, a difficult book than we, we, you would have done in another way? Not, not only 
as well as when we were reading books in the old days, but better, closer, how to get closer, which of course includes some of the argument about uh, closeness. So, very briefly, how do you get, and is it continuous or discontinuous, to move from paper, the website, the contribution, the face-to-face -face interactions, the revision of a project, which we are going to do in two weeks in Paris, 40 people will come to rewrite the book, and uh, a republication of the original pr proposition. This is, this is the movement which is called critical fortune, la fortune critique in French, and which we try to uh, underline and implement through the invention of digital uh, tools. So is it possible? Or in fact, is it a fake continuity? Everything is discontinuous. And actually, we will discuss that maybe if we have time for, for the discussion. It, it's very complex to answer that. For instance, the book is published, the paper book is published without any note, not even one single footnote. They just one line saying everything is on the website. And I got lots of reviews. People say it's a very interesting book, or it's just a very bad book. But it has one big defect, it has no footnotes. Because the footnotes and the documentation and the index are in the website. So, uh, not if I'd, the book was directed to people in this room, it would have been different. But not everyone knows that book can come in paper with their appara critique into a different medium. So this is one of the first primes we have about this question of closed reading and continuity and discontinuity, is that for some people the book appears as being unproved, it's just argument without any sort of documentation, and for people who have access to the book, paper book, and to the uh, site, there is plenty of documentation. So this is one of the first points we have when we try to move the, the borderline of the frontier that separates paper book from paper plus digital book. So let's see how this thing uh, works. We try to do one first thing, and this is from, of course, the work uh, of Donato Ricci, who is the head of a uh, design in my, in my school. This is a general rule of digital humanity. You always need an Italian designer at some point. <laughs> Not only for your clothing, but for the book. So what we did here uh, is that to invent a situation where exactly the same tone, the same font, the same pagination for the paper book and for the digital book. So that there is a sort of continuity which allows close reading to be done in two completely different mediums, the paper and the, uh, the, the digital. The traditional book first. Then the second prime, and that's a vast question as you know in your field, how do you renew on digital tool index, glossaries, footnotes, and all of these uh, elements? It has to be, remain very, very close. And what uh, Tomato, Tom, Donato Ricci and the others did was to keep on the same site, in a very easy access, the text, same pagination, and sa same font as the book, and then to have the three columns where you can read simultaneously the vocabulary, which is a mixture of index and glossary, and the footnote with a vast documentation and uh, to keep it in the same sort of flow so that it's easier to never lead, uh, lose, lose track sorry, of the, the book and its uh, footnote. I get in the detail because in the digital humanities we like details. We like to see how this thing is done and how it can be tested if it fails or not the project of close uh, reading. The third thing that we try to do is, is it possible to actually make constantly accessible the bookmarking? Because lots of people don't want when the bookmark to be immediately shifted away from the book. So we need to, in order, in order to have closed reading, what you could do with the paper book, but which is of course much easier when you deal with the digital version, which is to keep always your bookmark very close from the center of, of, of a book. So for instance, this is my bookmark page, and I keep the four columns system, that is on the left side is the text, then is the vocabulary and glossary, then is the footnote, and the fourth is actually contribution I will mention in uh, a minute. 
So you want to be close. This is trying to, to shift, to, to limit as much as possible the discontinuity between the set of practices which the digital try to emulate, imitate and uh, modify. And yet you should be able to use all of this material as freely as you want. You want to be close inside the sort of protected space of a closed reading, but you want to be able to copy paste the documentation in any way you want in your own uh, sort of usual uh, uh, site. This is the top is note taker and of course windows. So this is an important thing for closed reading. All of that was experimental and I'm sure many of you will uh, say, no, 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 this is not the way to do it, but this is why I wanted to give an example of uh, uh, something which was actually achieved for a long time with a large community of people contributing. Another way, and that's much more disputed, is the contribution. And contribution is not the same as commentary, as I said. Trying to avoid the commentarium and, and to have contribution always related to one part of the argument where people are, so to, scoop, so to speak, disciplined in paying attention to the argument and sort of proving your, their credential in saying, I want to attack or complement, modify this part of the book. So it's not uh, crowdsourcing, it's not a wiki attitude, it's actually concentrating the attention again on, uh, on uh, the book. And of course this is disputed because and also it costs a lot of money. You need to be funded by the ARC to have a critical fortune of a book accompanying the book itself. So we have eight mediators who are actually getting the contribution and editing them a bit like you would do in a uh, journal. And this is the, the, the system of contribution. You, you have your contribution there on the left side. You put it on your own personal space, which is protected and of course invisible to us inside the uh, database and then you decided to send it to the uh, mediators who then sort of edit them just like it was done for the contribution to this uh, meeting and then it's published. Then the contribution are assembled, we are now moving on the left, on the, sorry, on the right, and the contribution are assembled, this is what we are doing now, and they are reviewed in order to revise the original book, which is the paper book which is called, for this reason, a provisional report. And then we have another version of, of a book. So this is a, third, a first series of uh, little experiment to try to get the close reading uh, close enough. Now, of course, you need something else. You need a way to get, and this is, of course, something many of you work about, which is how do you get out of the fake linearity, linearity sorry, fake linearity of a paper book. And as many work has been done now on the paper book, we know that it's actually not nearly at all. People read the book in all sorts of paper book in all sorts of ways. But you need to use digital tool in order to make visible that the highly complex movement through the space of a book is actually done. And of course with digital tool you can do that pretty nicely. This is a distribution of a paper book and all the material in the commentaries, footnote, and glossary, spread in the space, and then reorganize depending on which question you ask for the book. So it means that you try to obtain a completely different vision of the book, which is actually the way we used to read paper book, but we were not aware because, again, we could not trace this uh, aspect of reading in a very strange way, taking, rereading, coming back, using all this sort of movement around the argument in order to get close reading. And without this, it would be impossible, of course, to do close reading. So in order to escape from the structure of the book, we try to reinvent a second way to get at the, at the book, not the four columns, which is the sort of first ways in which we found that it reused a lot of the tradition of book reading and invented a completely different one where this time, and this is of course linked to the content itself, the content is pretty uh, strange, it's a philosophical anthropology argument about mode of existence, and it means that every mode can be crossed with another, and this is one of a crossing between two modes of existence, and that you can interrogate the book and reread it in completely different ways 
which we found is absolutely necessary for close reading, which is, of course, again, what was done with the paper book, but it was done with great difficulty. And here, of course, when you begin to have lots of films, lots of documents, lots of photography, lots of commentary, you need another way to, to peruse the book and to enter into the argument in a very, very different way. Again, closeness and closure is, uh, conne are connected, and it's very important that we are able to uh, do this. But of course, all of that is still linked to the, to the argument of the, of, the, of the book and to the site, with the great difficulty, as I said, that when you have a paper book and the site, very few people actually have direct access to it. So is it continuous or discontinuous is one of the questions that I'm sure will move very, very fast in the future when we are very, very quick and very easy, easy, easy interface. But what you need in all cases is actually to be able to read the book with other people in order to understand and uh, check your own close reading and modify it. This, of course, has always been the case since there is the, uh, the beginning of thinking and not, it's not even linked to the book. It's actually part of what the academy is about and scholarly research has always been. But, of course, what is interesting with digitally enhanced technology for making the critical fortune of the book visible is that you can actually organize face-to-face -face meeting using the material of a site and then using the material of face-to-face -face interaction to feed the, the site itself. So we did 25 different meetings in different uh, places in the world with different topics which were designated by the contribution as a critical element of the uh, argument. And then we move through these different types and uh, trying to understand the book collectively. So, it, of course, it looks exactly like a normal discussion, the sort of thing we do in a meeting like that, except we have all the document of a site accessible to us. It doesn't matter what they say. It, and then uh, we act, sorry, it does matter what they said during the meeting, I mean, here. Uh, and the material which is assembled is then fed back into uh, the site. So here we have one gentleman who is contesting one aspect of the book. So the, the notes are being taken, it's projected on the screen. The designer is act are actually in real time making the, 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 the thing visible and then it's fed back onto the argument. And next week, or in two weeks, we are going to use this material to redo the book. And this is very important because it's actually because you have a digitally mediated interface that the close analysis can be shared. It can be shared to a, a community of co-inquirers, which existed before, of course, and it has always been the case, but which can be actually followed as well. So you see the, the thread is that many of the elements of a critical fortune of an argument can actually be followed segment by segment, and this is what we were interested in uh, doing. And of course, many of you work on that again, is that you can also follow the community in a way, the community of readers in a way which was impossible before. I've written lots of books, I have absolutely no idea of what people do with the books, but on this one, we have a very precise idea. Transforming a book into a web platform allows to visualize its readers and to be able to analyze their motivations and practices. Through the possibility of bookmarking parts of the platform's contents okay. and contributing to the inquiry, we can analyze readers' digital traces and their relation with the project's history, events and broader reception. For instance, we can see that the majority of the readership is mainly composed by other scholars and a certain number of students. As we look only at the people which have used digital bookmarks inside the platform to compose their personal almanac from the book, we can distinguish some very active readers who have produced a great number of bookmarks or used this feature regularly through a long period of time using the platform. So this is from Robin de Moutard's work, and there are lots of other work that we are doing for the fun of it, I have to say, to try to understand. For an author, it's quite interesting to see how they can visualize. This is the way people use the four columns according to, to time, and there are many, many other nifty little tools that we can develop to feel what the community 
is actually doing. Okay, let me conclude. Uh, what does it say about digital humanity? A field, again, of which I don't, I, I, I mean, sorry, no, I'm, I'm a member, and soon I will be certainly a professor here uh, in this field. Or maybe I failed my job interview, I don't know. Uh, what does it say about digital humanities? I'm trying to deflate the idea of digital humanity from a domain to uh, underlining a set of practice. So the first conclusion seems to me, but you are of course the judge of that, the first is that there is not much difference, in fact, between the older scriptoria, scriptoria and the newer uh, scriptoria, because in all cases, the critical fortune is made of a vast amount of uh, socio-technical element, cognitive element, and uh, community. The, the vibration through them is visible, but only through very, very tiny segment. So the, the, the one of the effects, which is pretty paradoxical, is I think the more we moved into digital humanities, the more we realized how complex was the older technology we, uh, it was, Gutenberg was mentioned, but lots of others, uh, including the Greek uh, ways of discussing theorems, we'd realize retrospectively how complex those techniques were there when we tried to keep some of their skills and some of their uh, practices in another uh, medium. The second uh, conclusion is that and that, I think, is, was alluded to by the president of the university in his talk, is that the more we move to the digital humanity, the easier it is to merge our practices with other scientific disciplines, including natural scientists. So this is a great novelty for the humanities. Very, it's now, we are all working in scrintoria. If you are a sociologist, or if you are a Greek scholar, or if you are an archaeologist, and if you are geographers, a geologist, an economist, or maybe not a physicist, it makes a, almost no difference. It's screen, screen toria can exchange their properties in a way which was impossible before when they were the book people and the article laboratory people. So I think we are all the, the coming now to a definition of, of the exeget. We are all exeget working in screen toria and we can exchange our properties much, uh, in a much easier way. And again, my conclusion is that, the third conclusion is that the digital is not a domain. It's, a, it's an entry. It's an entry into the socio-cognitive trajectories of which uh, the uh, digital underline only a few uh, elements. And finally, I want to make uh, a trans transposition of Lord Bacon famous sentences, and that would be my conclusion. But the image that you have here is the image from a very important work done by Adam Lowe at Factum Arte in Madrid, because I think it's an absolutely remarkable way of showing that the digital humanities field and the digitalization is actually a way toward analogical practices. Adam Lowe has, is, is now the, the sort of main a uh, laboratory workshop, a sort of 16th century workshop in Madrid, where he does perfect replica of work of art. Here it's the Tutankhamon's tomb, which is entirely replicated. And it's replicated in a way that actually the knowledge produced about the tomb is actually incredible. So that the more you reproduce a digital perfect, sorry, a material perfect replica because of the digital mediation, remember digital is an institution and not a real thing, is uh, precisely the way to go. That is, in the laboratory, the workshop of Adam Lowe in Factum, you get mass, a, mass, a, a massive amount of people working on all sorts of traditional trades, like sculptors, like painter, because digital is not seen as a domain of virtual but as a way of getting deeper into the materiality of the original work of art which is replicated. Hence my transformation of Lord Bacon, a little digitally inclines man's mind to virtuality, but theft in digitality 
brings a man's mind about to materiality. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Raise your hand. Yeah, there's one there. Just, just wait for the microphone. Is this a question? No. Okay. <laughs> Hi there. You talk about vibration as the third age um, in social, social studies. Um, if there was a natural scientist in this room, very likely when talking about vibration, things would come to mind like central limit theorem and stuff like that. And one would think if there's large numbers, you would find laws. So uh, is this the moment to be hesitant as a digital humanities community to say, let's go from an event discipline, in the words of Wimbrand, to a law discipline, or mix both up. So where, where is this? So there, we are standing on this cliff where we, where we you know, we, would, we should actually ask these questions. Are, they, are there laws in the large numbers? And what should we do with it? Should we also become physicists of culture? Or should we stay where we belong? In quotation marks? That's my question. <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that because uh, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not a great believer in the laws uh, of natural sciences as well. I think it, it's a way of getting into a close attention to phenomena. For example, if you take the, the novel, Moretti's argument about the novel, you, you do get laws, but it's much more interesting to be able to scan vast amount of literature. Is it to detect again, law and to transform the field of, of digital humanities in an ersatz of the natural sciences, I think it's exactly the opposite sense. That is, it, it goes into the other direction, which is to equip large amounts of, of socio-technical practices, uh, reading books together, uh, inquiring about complex uh, phenomena, which then makes the, the link between the natural sciences not, ah, we in humanities have as much law as you have, but on the contrary, we are like you, uh, uh, get used to live through uh, what we call a landscape of controversial data sets. And I think is, this is, in my view of the way I collaborate with the natural scientists, it's much more the direction where you go. That is, you talk with geographers, you, we, we also have a screen toria, you talk, so you might have local little laws, but that's not the goal. I mean, as I said, because then digital humanities is not humanity becoming positivist science, it's to learn through the fact that we have also equipped with our own screen toria to share the idea with other disciplines of common exegesis. It's all about interpretation of complex data which are uh, most of the time controversial. So navigating in common into landscape of controversial data and data should be called, in my view, sub -lata, that is, obtain, not donné. Sorry, in French, it's, we call them donné, which means given, and they are obtain. So there are lots of our words for data. Capta, sub -lata, but data, no. So uh, my, I'm, I, I will not go to the idea that, I mean, maybe you know much more about that, but I, I will not know that the collaboration is going to be to find the laws of writing novels, but certainly transform completely what it is to write novels, to have uh, 400 novels instead of, of, of five. Or in the case of a Venice example, I mean, transform completely what it is to do the history of Venice if you have nine kilometers of archives that you can go through. But what you go through is actually a highly specific, highly localized element. And that's what transforms completely the social sciences. That is, it's not about laws, it's about vibration, precisely, in the sense that Gabriel Tard, one of the founders of French sociology, used the word. Another word in French, but it doesn't work in English, was réplique. Lots of the things that you, you study with these traces are réplique. Not replicas, but replique, uh, aftershock. Mm. Twitters is a, is a set of replique. 
uh, reading, interpreting the amenotic circle is a set of haptic. So that's what I meant by vibration, not sort of a thing which will be open to the laws of writing novels or the laws of interpreting uh, city growth or that sort of thing. Even though laws are always sort of amusing. Another question there, two questions there. In the front. Yeah. Could you say a little more about the importance of closure? Yeah, well, I don't, I, this is a difficult question because I don't know if it's my age, which is in question here. <laughs> that is, I'm, I'm, I've been trained as a philosopher, and so to be enclosed in an argument, is it part of a trade, of a job description, which I've then tried to carry over into another uh, era, the era of contamination, quick access, instant, uh, what I call double-click information? Uh, or is it uh, something necessary to think creatively on long, long time? I mean, this is a project, the mode of existence has been working on, I've been working on for 30 years. So I have no answer to your question because I don't know if closure is, but you know that probably here, is a necessary con element that you need to, 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 to make manifest in these new tools. So for how important it is to, to have access to the all uh, apparat critique of a book without getting out of sight? Is it, is it part of what makes the ambiance around the work and the at attention concentrated? Or is it something that older people like me need to read books? So for that, we, we have a tool, which is the questionnaire that we are now uh, studying. And Robin, some of the things I showed are coming from that. Very interesting to uh, get the questionnaire at different age. How do people, so lots of people, which is bad for my royalties, but which is nice for, for them, have, have actually read only the digital book. 30% have read only the digital book. And the digital book offers some sort of protection against uh, distraction. Is this part of being concentrated? Cognitive science scientists would say yes. Uh, but we have to experiment. We have to experiment to see what, there is a moment, and it was disputed, of course, where closure means, ah, you try to reintroduce the, the sort of uh, elitist, closed community of the past. Because you refuse commentaries, you want only contribution, for instance. This, is, this was discussed. This is the sort of thing that we have to uh, experiment about. The reason why I showed this experiment is because it, I think it's in the domain, you, I might be, uh, um, you might say the opposite here, but I think in the, in the domain of complex philosophical text, I don't think there are that many experiments done on three years on trying to make, uh, to transport some of the skills necessary for it in the digital world. So this is why I chose the experiment, and also it's the only one I know about. There was another question there. If, if I heard you correctly, you suggested the, the digital is, is a fiction and the reality is the analog, right? And there's, there's this transformation that takes place. So I was hoping you might speak a little bit more about the value of that fiction, uh, particularly the fiction of our work, if we call ourselves the digital humanities. Uh, and that digital is a, is a piece of a fiction in terms of perhaps making things more real um, or more human. Right, so, so that kind of bridge between real and fiction caught up in, in that word digital that we define ourselves as. What is its role um, and the role of fiction in general there? Fiction is, is a positive term, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, yes. Of course. Or, I, I mean, not, nothing normative by it, right? It's, well, perhaps nor <laughs> interpret it as you will. No, no, I interpret fiction as a positive term. It's actually one of a mode of existence which is given its own objectivity and space in the product. Uh, one thing is, in France, we say numérique, humanité numérique, and that's pretty bad because it, it feeds into the formalist, formalist thinking of the French. Uh, but digital seems to be an anglicism, so we have, we have trouble with this word. But digital, and my, Simon Schaffer has written the whole um, sort of history of the digitality throughout, the, uh, and actually the first uh, digital, in the, in the practical sense, is actually uh, 
uh, the materia nigra, the, the way you produce um, a, a certain type of, of colored effect, half, uh, half tone, I think it's called in English, is actually the first digital um, techniques. In the, not in the sense that it zero and one, in the fact that it tried to achieve uh, continuity through this discontinuous element which are prepared before inking it. Uh, it's, it's an engraving process, half tone. So, digital humanities, I think, is, is a very nice word to re-insist on the materiality. That's my argument. It, because it means that instead of having... Lo lots of people believe that actually the word of cognition, philosophy, literature is abstract. And we all know how practical it is. We all know how much sweat we know how heavy are the books when we carry them, how uh, completely involved we are uh, cognitively and emotionally when we read books, etc. So it, everything that directs attention again at the materiality is important. So I see the digital as doing exactly that, which is to remind people that some of the features of the materiality necessary to produce collective of people reading collectively complex arguments or complex literature is actually made clari uh, clarified, no, underlined, passed with a stabilo effect uh, through the digital. So uh, before fiction could appear something which was in the cloud, now you know that you need nuclear plant. And that's great. So if people say, oh, you are all in the cloud, you humanity, you say, no, no. Digital is 30 nuclear plant just to have the data accessed. So this is nice. <laughs> one la oh, many, many uh, end raises, maybe uh, one last question here. As your demonstration was quite interesting and I like the way uh, you demonstrate the close reading you practice with your team. Um, but I have a strange impression is your ethos is perfect, your performance is perfect, your actio is perfect. But I have the impression that I don't feel like reading the book uh, that you showed one in your experiment of the, uh, the close reading of the book. Everything around is interesting, but the, the book itself escapes my attention. Perhaps it's in the way it's the projection, the image, and the image is much uh, uh, more feeble than your performance. So there is something quite interesting in the way you uh, demonstrate the, 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 the strength of digitization is uh, that the human, um, uh, the human element is uh, much more important than the image and the, the schemas and the moving schemes that you've shown. That is a very impress impressive in your, in your talk. So you mean I'm a good speaker, but I'm a terrible uh, writer, or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, perhaps uh, I have to take time to read the book itself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, how, how much time do we have? <laughs> No, it, first it's a great book, and, uh, but it's called a provisional report, and it's made out of a little anthropologist who is uh, trying to understand what the moderns have done, and um, because we have never been modern, as you know, and the problem is what positively we, we the we being itself a question, uh, we have been. So she moves around a lot of things and trying to understand the Anthropology of the Modern, which is the subtitle uh, of the book, but it's thought as a provisional report which is now being revised. So what I wanted to show, and, and of course I had to decide, this is digital humanity, it's not anthropology of the modern. If I'd addressed anthropology of the modern assembly, I would not have talked about the book, except to say there is a site, but I've, I did the opposite. And of course, I understand what you mean, is that I redid the usual distinction between sort of process and, and content. I apologize for that. But the content is, is pretty tough. Um, so I, I, no, I don't think I have a way to, an, to uh, answer your question. Yes. 
Uh, but read the book. I think it will do a lot of good. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, let's and start. contribute. <laughs> but don't comment. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. In a couple of minutes, we will walk to the Rolex uh, Learning Center for the second part of our evening. Uh, as you will see, it's a very special building for those who don't know him. Uh, there you will enjoy a buffet. And at 8.30, you will have a dance performance by the company Linga entitled Remapping the Body. This dance performance is a result of a collaboration with the University of Lausanne Institute of Sports Science, so don't miss it. And you will also get a chance to see one of the many uh, Digital Humanities 2014 satellite events, the Book Lab exhibition, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Melanie Picard from Swiss Next San Francisco, who will say a few words about this special event. Thank you. Um, I have to say it's uh, very intimidating to take the stage uh, right after Bruno Latour, who not only is a stunning uh, orator, but also was my professor not so long ago. And this, especially now that he discussed the, the closed book fallacy. But I'm very happy to be here um, to talk about the Swiss Next San Francisco exhibition, the book lab with you. I'm gonna be short and I'm gonna start with a question. Where do you think books will go in the future as object, as art, and as vehicle for knowledge? This, oops. This is the crucial question we are exploring with the Book Lab, an exhibition investigating the role of books in the digital era through projects created by a next generation of young artists from Swiss schools of art and design. An earlier version of the Book Lab was shown in San Francisco in October 2013 and was part of Futures of the Book, an entire week of discussions about the future of reading and writing. Oops. In the preface of this exhibition, was written by Frédéric Caplan, you can read an inspiring message. The digital revolution essentially extends the dimension of traditional books and calls for expansive creativity. So if books aren't dead, the question is, what could they become in the future? Each of the projects you can see in this exhibition poses an essential sub-question to this main question and offers a suggestion to how the digital revolution can expand the dimension of books. For, exam for example, can digital tools enhance co-creation and make the reader an active component of the narrative? How can apps deepen a story with transmedia elements? How can digital screens interact with objects or paper? Oops. Or can a book actually browse a database? Or in other words, can um, the traditional format of a book be a useful tool to flip through a huge set of digital data? What does a book of big data look like? Can books help us visualize complex data? And why should digital fonts be static if they actually could be reactive and express much more? If those questions are important for you, and if you're curious to experiment some of the tentative answers, I invite you to visit the exhibition, the book lab, at the Rolex Learning Center tonight or any time until the end of the week. We will be there and we'll be happy to welcome you. Swiss Next San Francisco, uh, an initiative of the State Secretariat for Education, Research and Innovation. It's a platform for the exchange of knowledge and ideas in science, education, art and innovation. We are honored to be part of this discussion about cultural, uh, digital cultural empowerment and we look forward to fruitful conversation. Of course, all our projects um, count on precious support of partners. Uh, this edition of the Book Lab is made possible by Proelvetia, Head Genève, EPFL, Affaires Culturelles et Artistiques, Mémoire Vive, and of course, uh, Digital Humanities 2014 organizers. We hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank 
you, Melanie. Um, another interesting thing happening um, when we will be at the University of Lausanne in the next three days is that we have a professional photographer studio that will be installed inside the conference near the posters. And you have uh, for three days the possibility of having a picture of yourself taken in this condition. It will be uh, both, I mean, uh, a souvenir uh, that you can use for your own purpose, but it's also a way of making a kind of Facebook of that community, that theme that Claire was mentioning in her uh, welcoming um, address. So don't hesitate. You'll, you'll, you'll see that that booth. Have your picture taken, and we'll be very glad then and to to actually uh, map physically. I mean. Uh, all the face we see from quite far away now. And so now, before just to. Okay. And now, just before to leave to the Rolex Center, you will get a, a glass of water, of orange juice, when we, you are just outside of the room. And tomorrow, we meet not here, but at the UNIL Amphimax. So we are done with our EPFL part and we switch on to the University of Lausanne. So nine o'clock uh, at the Amphimax, one stop metro, five minutes by foot. And the most and last important moment of our opening ceremony is please all our volunteers, let's come on the stage in order that we can thank you a lot. All the volunteers, please come here. We, we can really be proud of our international team, and in particular, we would like to thank Kevin Barmer, the soul of our meeting. Kevin! <laughs> so, if you want to know who is the person who has made all these nice graphics that you see uh, around and who has the idea of this network, this is Dario Rodiguero. Can please step, step in? <laughs> And now, if we have got the book of abstracts and a nice website, it's thanks to Cyril Borne. <laughs> we have two media managers. I mean, they're dealing with the Twitter account and with the website, Yannick Rocha and Martin Grandjean. Yeah. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, as you know, we have a fun run, like any uh, uh, DH conferences. And this year, the fun run is organized by Alicia uh, Fuka. So if you want to join, it's on Thursday. And so, well, all the other volunteers, which you will see in the rooms, I mean, you can recognize them through their badges. They are green, through their t-shirts, which uh, have just been printed out today. And uh, we wish you really a very nice uh, conference with that very dedicated team. Thanks a lot. Let's go to the Rolex Center and see you tomorrow at the UNIL.